to continue from yesterday we are still talking about the how to practice <clears throat> how to understand and practice the authentic view <clears throat> which is the foundation for all the our other practices that we do whether it is the practice of accumulation or practice of uh, wisdom and uh, also it is a uh, confident it is uh, I would say the self-esteem When you have a right view, it is like you have a good, uh, healthy, high self-esteem towards the our goal and our path. <coughs> and uh, yesterday. I talked about basically um, the it is important to understand the differences of the two truths conventional and the ultimate truth but at the same time it is very important not to become a too like this discriminative uh, thoughts between the truth of thinking that ultimate is good and the conventional is bad or something like that. In fact, we usually say that um, understanding the unity of two truth is what is the uh, authentic view. But it might be a little bit difficult for us to understand it. But if we take it as what it means is that um, taking conventional truth as a means or method in order to uh, lead or in order to recognize the ultimate truth would be the properly more comprehensible way to understand the uh, meaning of the unity of two truth <coughs> so that you don't disregard the parts and fall into the extremes of the nihilist saying that oh everything is emptiness everything is conventional <laughs> So today, um, just continuing from that, but I will try to explain more focusing on the dependent itself. Because again, the another way to look at whether you have a right view or not is that whether you have understood the law of dependent correctly or not. <coughs> and uh, I 
again we talk about this um, in Mahayana uh, our view our meditation uh, our conduct has to be on the middle way not falling into the one of the extremes and uh, as an ordinary human being we have almost this automatic sense that um, how to say we like to fall into the one of extremes and that's why it's not easy it's a very challenging but at the same time it is a very important <clears throat> In the Mahayana aspiration, it states that uh, what is the ultimate, the middle way or the uh, authentic middle way view meditation and conduct, what it means. It says that uh, the Middle way ground is the ground of true truth, which is uh, free from the two extremes. So again, as a view, if we understand the mechanism or the nature of true truth, it will help us not to fall into the two extremes of nihilism and the eternalism. And this is what we call the authentic crown or unmistaken crown, we can call it. And based on this ground, through the understanding of true truth, we can practice the middle way uh, path and it says that uh, the middle way path is that the uh, path which is free from the exaggeration and the denigration <clears throat> So in the, this context, exaggeration would be thinking something, uh, putting some sort of imputation, but it is not. And denigration would be not recognizing what it is. And uh, through this uh, middle way ground or middle way view, we have a middle way practice or middle way path. And what happens when you combine this ground with the path and you will gain the result or you will you will you will reach to the state which is called the authentic middle way result. And again it says that uh, the authentic middle way result is the result which is free from samsara and nirvana so conventionally again we can say that samsara is something to be abandoned and nirvana is something to be achieved but then, again, if you look at it from the ultimate point of view, even we have to go beyond the Nirvana, because again, in this context, the Nirvana is only Nirvana related to the Samsara. And uh, sometimes, 
we can also see the statements like that again and again in the sutras and the shastras that uh, wise one even should not in the middle way because as long as in your conventional level it is okay to use the word middle way but if you still think a oh, middle way is then it's still a subtle clinging. It's a good clinging, healthy clinging, compared to the extreme clinging, but still a clinging. And maybe that's why uh, if you look at texts like Krishna Paramita text. Buddha, when Buddha says that there's no attainment, there's no cessation. Yeah? But mostly I think we forget that Buddha also said that there's not non-cessation. Mostly I think we forget that word. So, when we hear the word, there's no cessation, I think what we understand is also there is no cessation. We understand it as a non-cessation, non right? But then, because of that, Buddha immediately said the second line, there's no non-cessation. So again, as long as we are in this zone of conventional and path, <clears throat> there's a f many different layers of path. Mm. All of them are path, but it is very important to understand it is a path, not a vision. Even it is in the conventional too, it is in the zone of dualistic, but again it is very important to understand that this is very necessary, this is very helpful illusion. <clears throat> so it is uh, that's why when we say that the authentic middle way result is beyond samsara and nirvana is what it means it means beyond conventional dualistic samsara nirvana So, there's always two things, conventional and ultimate, exaggeration and the denigration, samsara and nirvana. Hmm? Is it definitely uh, not completely wrong to have this kind of excitement and the disappointment towards these negatives and positive? This is actually supposed to be how you practice initially but at the same time it is very important to keep in mind that still these are part it's not a result <clears throat> and that's why if we read the Madhya Nika text we will see lots of statements like uh, you know they're saying that if you think everything is exist, you are as stupid as a cow. But then, through the overconfidence, if you think that oh nothing exists, and it says that you are even more stupid than the cow. Even cow believes in the dependent, and when he is hungry, he goes for the grass. He don't say I don't want to eat because it's empty. So this is very, very challenging to understand. Not maybe understanding is not challenging, but to accepting is challenging. Again, because of our this karmic formation, the ignorance, our mind is almost designed 
to respond on the mechanism of duality yeah. and this is exactly going opposite of that non-duality state and because of that our mind almost stop functioning or it doesn't make any sense or it doesn't fit in my program so to speak you know <coughs> So again, all these extremes of ground path and fusion, if you really look at why we fall into these extremes, we just cannot understand and cannot accept these two, you can say these two words, then and del. So this is the Tibetan word for dependent. So if you don't understand the word meaning of this dependent, then and then you make some sort of mistakes and fall into the one extremes. And when you don't understand the other part del or del or jungwa, and then you make certain kind of mistakes and falls into that extremes. Now what happens is that whenever we do that, it will tickle our excitement and disappointments unnecessarily yeah, through the exaggeration and the denigration. <coughs> and if you look at in our old sufferings, emotions, and especially all these um, emotional big ups and downs, are nothing but this overly imbalanced excitement and disappointment triggered by these two exaggerations and denigrations, which is coming from the very foundation of ignorance. <clears throat> so now, mm, because of that, mm, Buddha, when Buddha says that when you see the dependent, the ones who one who sees the nature of dependent origination, he will see the reality. Yeah? So that's the meaning. Because when you see the dependent origination, you will never exaggerate or denigrate and this is the exactly when you don't exaggerate you will just take it as it is and this is how you see the reality <clears throat> it could be very deep such as just perceiving flower as a flower to the very shallow things such as thinking that oh maybe uh, uh, black hair is beautiful or maybe blonde hair is beautiful or something like that now of course we react in that way the problem again is that when I think that let's say this flower when I see this beautiful flower, it's okay, but the problem is that I will take this phenomena, flower, beautiful, not dependent upon, you know, my beholders, my, uh, <coughs> I don't think in the way that this is flower and this is beautiful because I'm a human being, I have that kind of potential to experience this as a flower and maybe I like yellow color you know there's so many things happening there and then I just take it as oh there's a beautiful flower outside there by its own nature that is the big mistake what we make that means again I have a denied the dependent of the nature of flower 
and I took it as almost like a one external beautiful such things established by its own quality without depending on anything on my call habit or any other things <clears throat> so the and we'll say yul ramayana dupa the object that is established by its own virtues and the stronger that you have that belief the wrong view the strong your reaction would be almost like without any control more you understand that this beauty is something to do with what kind of I am who is seeing the so called beauty this will be still there but you will gain some kind of control over how to react upon it you won't be completely I would say exploited by this external object and that is very very important because many times we feel helpless our emotion react our emotional reactions why because it's something as if something out is you know, taking our control isn't it i cannot control it i cannot stop thinking about this i cannot do this so once you understand it's very much coming from the subject is very much coming from the one who experiences it, since it's your reaction and you feel like yeah it's there but how i react to this object is up to me and you will feel some sort of confident and clarity that i can work with it because it's my reaction it's my mind and that's why <clears throat> Now, the dependent, okay, so in Tibetan we say ten jing jagar jungwa or ten del, and it is translated in English as a dependent origination or dependent or interdependent. But I think in Tibetan the word is quite as strong because you can take one word and then uh, ten literally means the dependent, and here del means actually relationship. Okay. <coughs> so now it actually, if you understand these two words, it will answer so much of our questions uh, such as a very general questions as why we are here you know, what might happen when I die or if something happens to us like if you get sick you know the, normally we we'll ask questions why me you know so many all these questions can be answers from these two what actually even such things as who, who who made this world or you know do I have this self free will or it is controlled by some outer elements <clears throat> because it's everything it's almost answer in this two world <clears throat> now to make it short uh, so when you understand these two ten and del Again, the basic idea is that it will help you to remain in the middle way, not to fall into the two extremes. So, for example, this ten refers to the all the phenomena, whether it is uh, external phenomena or internal phenomena, such as our emotions, our aggregates, our body, our mind. Everything has a cause, has depend on something. There's no one phenomena if we investigate that we found comes from without cause. So the first word 
refers to that all the results are dependent on the certain causes and conditions. So now this will help us not to fall into the thinking that things just happens random or things just happens without cause. And this will uh, help us to not to fall into the extremes of nihilism. Because as long as you believe that there is a cause for the result, and you are not into the nihilist, right? We might, not, we might not be able to answer exactly, okay, so what is cause of this particular phenomena? That we might not know. But when you generalize as in logic, as in the common sense, you know, all the things we see has a cause. So you can use the same logic, even then we don't know what it is, but it shows there must be cause. Because it is sometimes there, sometimes not there, it's not always there. Right? And it shows that there is a cause. <coughs> now again, this is very important, as I said there, you know, this denigration. So if you understand this was dependent, it will help you to fall, not to fall into the extremes of denigration. Now the second word, del, literally means the relationship. So this means, yes, things all the results comes from cause, but does it mean that any kind of cause can produce any kind of result, or there's a particular relationship, right? Now this is, there's a, not only there's a cause, but there's a very uh, particular relationship between the cause and effect. Now this is important, and also it's a little bit um, not that clear to us, I mean, it's, I mean uh, we can see certain things, you know, how it is relationship, but there's many, many things that we don't know. But it shows that things are not random. Cause and the uh, effect has a certain relationship. And this is very important because, remember, if you, if you have want to understand the karma, right, and this is exactly, if you believe that this is a cause, and then there is a certain relationship between the cause and effect. That means you are accepting the karma. Means the things are not random. Mm. There is certain kind of order. <clears throat> and this, again, will eliminate the idea or the misconception that maybe things comes from some sort of uh, refuted causes, you know, thinking like uh, maybe it is made by certain kind of power, you know? so you don't mistake it with the real cause. And you can also call, you know, look at it from like, it will help you not to fall into the extremes of eternalism and seeing the real cause instead of refutation cause. And when you look at what is the relationship between the, the phenomena and then this creator, and you don't see relationship you know, and you only see the relationship between what is happening there and what is its causes. Now, the first one maybe it's not that difficult that we go through, but the second one, since our sense is very limited and there are so many things, especially our feelings, our emotions, our suffering and the happiness are very much happening in the subtle level, law of cause and effect. Even though it's working very orderly, but it's very hard to see as you see the farming, you know, when you farm, you say, oh, this is tree and this is fruit. 
but in the emotional level, even though the same system is happening there, which we call the inner dependent origination, but because we only experience the gross and generalized feelings and we cannot really trace back and see how it's happening very fast. So this is very important to understand because if you accept this, you can accept karma and you will also really understand what karma means in Buddhism. When Buddhist says that actually suffering comes from karma and the disturbing emotions, you will see it very clearly. So karma doesn't necessarily mean you did something past that is happening right now, but it's saying that there's certain kind of causal condition which is triggering our emotions and feelings the right now. <clears throat> so Mm, then this is again this when you understand the second word the relationship the the the, the deal and you will understand that it will help you not to exaggerate it if I say oh this flower is not coming from the, its cause and conditions, but it is made by some person, then I will, it will be exaggerating it. If I say, oh, this flower is coming from its seeds, water, time, oxygen, whatever it is necessary, then I'm not exaggerating it. So this I have to understand. When you understand Dell, you will understand that, oh, this is flower, it's just happening there because of its there is a certain relationship between this flower and the, its seeds. <clears throat> now, okay, now, that's the, so there is a causes and condition, but then when the causes and condition produces certain results, it's not random. There's a certain kind of order, and we can call it law of nature. So, for example, um, first of all, let's say, um, okay, let's put it this way. In, in this level, let's, what is conventional truth? So maybe you think that uh, uh, you're watching me and hearing my voice, right? Uh, maybe directly or in the monitor. But actually what is happening there is that there's a certain kind of visual causes and conditions happening and there's certain kind of, let's say, the sound or the wave causes and conditions happening. And we generalize it, yeah, and impute it and exaggerate it. So, for example, maybe you think that you are looking at me or hearing my voice, but actually, what is happening in this level is that you are just staring at the monitor with the lots of pixels in there, and also you are just uh, hearing the imitation of my voice that is converted into the certain kind of uh, waves and that is translated into the machine and that is went into the your <laughs> ear and you're just, it's more like photocopying, yeah? It's not really like my sound. Similar. So now this, oh, I'm seeing this person and hearing this voice is a conventional truth. And then the second layer of there, the combination of merely the combination of pixel and uh, you can trans get some sort of reactions by hearing this different length of web and mean making it meaning like a conventional truth you know it, it, it is not senseless it has a sense now if you look at all these mechanisms 
actually you see there's a two thing exactly happening why this is happening so well even though it's so untrue but it's working so well because of ten and tail now the ten will be that if you wanted to see me or if you wanted to hear me you can just oh I wanted to see him it doesn't happen right so you have to go open up your laptop you know turn on all this you have to go through all this process so this is what we call dependent right it's not one thing there's uh, so many things it is needed and of course we have to prepare everything that is needed in order to see the image and the sound and now the interesting thing is the second thing so there's a certain mechanism it's not random second one the word del the relationship every time you push the you know the, the, the power button it will turn on or off the computer it's not that you, you push the computer button and suddenly water comes out of computer you know it's not like that uh, so there's a certain kind of conventional agreements and the laws that if you know how to push this button as a result that will happen and it's always like that mm. similarly maybe you know once you go into the computer and there will be lots of things you can do but then you maybe go to the certain apps and you know click it and it always happened that way the way you want you cannot just go to adding sound apps and then expecting it to be the video it doesn't happen like that why because there's a certain relationship between what you're doing and what's going to happen now this order is a, almost like a magic but at the same time it's a very elusive imagine that this flower is a flower why because it has an order like where the leaves has to be how it shape color function you know it has an order imagine if this is completely disordered I won't be able to recognize this as a flower even though it is the same uh, components if you chop this flower you know and grind it and show me what is this I won't be able to so we have this own image of order and our own mental what do you call the projector to be recognized these things and that's why it will for example let's say when you look at into the screen why you see me yeah why not somebody else because there's a certain kind of order of pixels in the colors if you I don't know if this is the right word or not if you disorder the you know this order of pixels you won't see me yeah similarly uh, when I say emptiness you will also hear the emptiness why why you don't hear like apple or banana right why it happens because the, there's a certain kind of order relationship between the I don't know the, the electric length that I comes from my mouth and it translates into your ear it has a certain kind of similarities relationships and that's why if you understand what is the cause you can almost predict the result 100% because there's this specific relationship that's why if the samsara is possible nirvana is also possible and that's why we believe that four noble truth is so important that actually buddha told us told us very clearly what is the order of our suffering and what is the order of our 
happiness, so to speak. Yeah? It's almost like you're telling someone, this is the DNA of suffering and this is the DNA of happiness. Right? That's amazing discovery, isn't it? Because then you can do something, right? Otherwise, completely lost, we never know what to do. Because now, we know the cause, we can do something. And if the suffering is possible, samsara is possible, working with it, nirvana is also possible. You know, if the illusion is possible, you know, then reality is also possible because it's the same logic, the same reason. So the second thing, <coughs> relationship, it means everything has a certain kind of order or the its own pattern, so to speak. And once you understand what is the pattern, you can change a lot. Everything can be overcome, so to speak. And similarly, our mind has also order. And this is exactly why we meditate, why we study, to understand what is my negative order, what is my positive order, and once you understand the causes, so that you can eliminate the result by eliminating the causes. For example, um, if you press certain kind of button in the computer, and then you can delete the thing, yeah, and it has because of that order. So, these two words, Dependent and the uh, origination, or dependently originated, or I think dependent is more clear because there's a delwa, kentang delwa, you know, the relationship. So, two things to be understood in order to understand the reality and free from the two extremes. Not only that, but to see the reality as it is without exaggeration and denigration is to understand that all the phenomena has a cause, it has a, it depends on something and also all the results and the causes a certain kind of relation. And when you figure out these two things, you can say that you can you figure out everything, you know, because all the phenomena works in these two law, dependent and origination or ten and delva, pratitya samuppada. And actually, if you look at in the broader way, this includes everything from vulnerable to karma, samsara, nirvana, you know. And you can, because of, because of that, and Nagarjuna said that the theory of everything would be the dependent origination. Once you understand the dependent origination, you understand everything. Once you miss that, there's always, you're stuck somewhere. And that's why he says that there is no phenomena that is not dependent. All the phenomena are dependently originated in the law of these two. And because of that, now interestingly is that because of that everything is dependent, uh, there is no phenomena which is not emptiness. So now we may argue that this flower is not emptiness because it is dependent, right? Nagarjuna would say that no, you are completely wrong. It's the opposite. This flower is emptiness because we can experience it as a dependent. If something is not dependent, it cannot be emptiness. It's a little bit difficult to digest, mm -hmm. but then it makes sense, you know, when you think about that. Because when you say, when we say it is empty, because it means it is dependent, because of that it is empty. It doesn't have its own mm. essence, right? 
and imagine that it has its own essence without depending anything that cannot be emptiness. And unfortunately, if the flower, flower is not emptiness, I cannot see it and smell it. You cannot cut it. Because it's not dependent. I can cut it because it's dependent. So, yeah, I think to sum up, I think uh, what we were discussing is that uh, traditionally we have a view, meditation and contact or ground path in fruition and especially to understand, to really make our practice, whether it is ground or path or fruition, genuine, real, unmistaken, it is very important to have the right view. And when you have a right view, right meditation is almost like automatic. And first of all, it is very important to have a view. Because if you don't have a view, and there is actually, you, are me you cannot meditate. I mean, you can, but then your meditation won't become a real meditation. Because, again, meditation means nothing but the maintaining your view, number one. Number two, without a view, even though we are practicing, but then there's so many questions, doubts, you know, comes. Again, please don't ask just questions from outside. Whatever you're practicing, you can find answers from that. But unfortunately, we don't do the enough study and contemplation. That's the problem. For example, if you study the uh, the sixteen aspects of four noble truths, so many frequently asked questions is really answer. And through that, you become a very confident, and this confident is what we call the view towards. Merit, may all attain the missions, may it defeat the enemy of wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, from the ocean of samsara, may it free all beings.